We are back. The Real Kipper and Bourne Show. Nick Kiprios, Justin Bourne, Sammy McKee, Derek Brandeo, Jen Rolnick with you this hour. Leaf edition of our show. We are live on Sportsnet 590, Sportsnet 360, Sportsnet Plus from 4 to 6 as always. And if you don't catch us live, find us on your favorite podcast download. My favorite hockey anniversary of the year, every year today. Uh, 14 years ago today, Sidney Crosby shot it into the net, boys, in overtime against the United States of America. The- and we n- haven't seen it since. <laughs> well, no, we did. We did it in 2014. We saw it. I just mean, the- no, I mean oh, the so- highlights. Like, oh, uh, no, no one's ever oh, allowed to yeah, see that. Yeah, again. yeah, yeah, that. Okay, yeah, yeah. And but- I had by far the best seat in the house. Where were you? Like, I want to say eight rows up on a hydraulic uh, set. Wow. So you were doing the... The Olympics. The, yeah, so you were doing the post-game James for Duffy, Yeah. Bob McKenzie, Darren yep. Pang, and myself wow, were the panel. It was cross. For, for every game. Yeah, I do remember Three that a now. day. Yeah. That's a lot of games. That's a lot of hockey. So you're like, but here's all the uniforms. Slovakia. All the uniforms were looking the same color. Yeah. <laughs> by the end of it. That's a lot Except of Except that game. And yeah. I will ask how... I mean, there's no cheering in the press box, but... Oh yeah, we, the yeah, we we were all excited, yeah, for sure, because no one was going to throw things at us after we left the building. <laughs> Everybody was just drunk and cheering, yeah, yeah. which made it a very nice Did walk you guys back to the. Openly celebrate? I no, I don't. No, I don't remember it that way. No, yeah. it's not like we jumped in a car and waved a flag. No, I meant like in the moment. Yeah, were you, were you like, yeah. let's go? Yeah, as Canadians, okay. absolutely. All right. all right, yeah, I celebrated. <laughs> what time of day was that at? Do you remember? Yeah, it was afternoon game. It was the last event of the Olympics, right? But it would have been, so I think it, it would have been, been Eastern. It would have been, uh, yeah, somewhere late afternoon. Yeah. yeah. I just remember having to leave the bar and write an article for the score at the time. About it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which, the coherence of which could be yeah. debated to this day. I'd actually like to read that one on air if you could <laughs> dig that up. I, the score nuked everything. I don't think anything ever yeah. there's, exists anymore. And 14 years. 14 years. Today. Iggy. Wow. And the funny thing about that is he was not very good in that tournament up until then. Who's that? that was Sid. It was oh, like yeah. one of the main talking points in that tournament is that he hadn't had a very good tournament. He hadn't scored yeah. much. I think his only goal was against Switzerland leading up until then. Nice give and go. Yeah. And he he had a he was two two three uh, feet off the goal line and and went uh, five hole on Ryan Miller. A little bit of Patrick Kane um, Stanley yeah. Cup winner to it, right? Except we knew this went in. Yeah. The, that, it, it was in our end too. Yeah. So. And do you remember uh, right after that? Ron Wilson was the coach of the Leafs at the time. It was a complicated time as a Leaf fan because Brian Burke was the general manager yeah. of the United States and Ron Wilson was the coach. And, like, in his first media availability, he was like, wow, you know, the ref had got out of the way. And he was, like, immediately oh, hammering, like, the official. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, he was, like, he was so sour about it. We're right no, you so. just get annoyed. <laughs> can't, can't the crowd chanted fire so, Ron Wilson. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was great. It was one of the best days of my life. For sure. Very good. We got a good show today in terms of uh, guests. Uh, Steve Aliquette, of course, will join us uh, at, what, 4.30? 4.35. Uh, we'll ish, discuss yeah. more on the Leafs goaltending scenario and, and what's out there in terms of the marketplace. And Rempe media, and Mania continues tonight at Madison Square Garden, too. Rempe, so. we'll, we'll get his thoughts on that as well. That's, uh, that's quite the story. Uh, that took the league by storm, I think, in the last week. Yeah. So we'll see how that progresses with Valley. And then in the next hour, Cody Hodgson. Mm-hmm. Remember first pick uh, of Nashville in 2016? I think he went 10th overall. No, that was in... Oh. It, it was Vancouver who picked him. Oh, Vancouver. He, reti- he retired. Game was he retired. That's right. Yes. He retired. Yes. Yeah. See, I should know that because I... Your boys. I, I skated with him all... All year, and I got him back into pro hockey. Yeah, he he was drafted tenth in 08, and Kip did get him back in into pro hockey. And he had the record right. vaguely oh eight, and then uh, shut it down in two thousand sixteen, mm-hmm. and now he's back again, yeah. scoring goals for Milwaukee. And we're Eight gonna have him on the show at the top later, of the hour. We are. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, in the meantime, the Leafs seven game winning streak gets shut down, mm. and. One of our lasting thoughts on yesterday's show was the West Coast trip and the adjustment. And then I watched the first period 
and I'm totally on board with Sheldon talking about it being as one of the better periods. Yeah. From the Leafs all year. You look at got, chances both ways. They dominated. I, I got a total vibe of the stretch of hockey that we've seen over two weeks is is continuing. Mm -hmm. And then the second and the third period was like a thud. It all came unglued, didn't it? Um, yeah, but they did come out with a pretty good effort. Weren't able to put one in the net, which, you know, often lets the other team hang around and get that belief a little bit. But, uh, yeah, good start to say the least. Why don't we start with Sheldon, do his overview of the game, and then we can launch Perfect. into it. Let's go. Our first Clippers, Kippers Clipper of the day. Loved our start. In fact, I thought it was our best start of the season. Thought it was better than any start we had when we were on the road. We were really going. Guys were flying and puck. Puck was moving well. Our pace was outstanding. We had great scoring chances. Didn't score. Line changes, a shift flank, like everything that you wanted uh, in the start of the game. Um, I thought we were tremendous there. Puck didn't fall for us. And then I thought it, it, it because it was going so well, I thought we started to overdo it. I thought we got too comfortable in the game. You can't get comfortable against this team. Like, they're just too good defensively. Uh, and I thought we got cute with it. I really slowed our game down and allowed them to kind of settle in and it's it's a pretty even game uh, from there until we uh, you know we make a mistake and uh, you know they get the lead and then now the game you're you got to kind of open it up and, and chase it a bit to to me the very obvious here but the moment of the game they lost the game was the the, Dev the Devaris turnover in the corner that after they had finally got the momentum back, Bertuzzi scored. Yeah, it's funny how now Bertuzzi's the only one who can score. Mm -hmm. It's like he went from he never can score to he's the only one who scores oh, now. Right. But uh, that turnover by Tavares that leads to the shot from the slot by Carlson just felt like it broke them, and they had nothing left after that one. That's that's how it felt to me. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like the the goal, the, the score of the Barbashev one to yeah. make it one nothing is very indicative of, it's just something the Leafs do where they get offensively obsessed and they start to creep in and think offense. And once it's not going in, right, they push and they get chances. Everything becomes like, how are we going to get this next goal? And they forget the other team's allowed to play too. And you watch that goal, Domi's creeping and Nylander's creeping. D are coming down. Barbershev's just like, I'm, I'm Wide here. open. Yeah, and that that happened again. A Nylander uh, break turned into a breakaway against for Amadio. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've just seen that over the years at the Leafs where they just get, like, focused on, no, oh, it's not going in. How do we score? And then the other way. Okay, you went... Tavares, you went defense. So where do we go on our next clip? What do you want? Defense? Yeah, let's go over the, on J JT. The JT one's very short because it's asked about if um, he's feeling hurt or if there's something going on with him. So we can play that clip and you can hear his answer if you want to do that on Tavares. Let's go. Yeah. The injury, is your, what's your sense of where he's at physically? Like, is that a bit discomfort at times tonight? No, I, I, don't, I don't sense that. I think he's, he's fine. There you go. <laughs> He's fine, eh? He's fine. Not hearing it. Okay, let's stay on Tavares for a split second here yeah. um, because we've watched JT throughout his career with the Islanders and five seasons with the Leafs. Yep. And I've never seen him more animated than last night with the the reaction off of the, the goal that you just spoke of or coming to the bench and slamming his stick. And I don't know if I've ever seen him do that no i i, I haven't has anybody yeah, there's like maybe the odd one off yeah. but you're right there's not many games but it's where not he's like consistently him. frustrated yeah so is that just in a a single play or is that i've been demoted and i'm no longer on the power play i think they work hand in hand kept you know i don't think you I don't think suddenly he has a moment or two where he's so frustrated that he just has a whole night like that. Like, I think it's related to he hadn't been scoring. He had been feeling, I know he had more recently after they make the, made these changes, but he hadn't for a long stretch. And then you start to feel your importance on the team slip away a little bit, right? Like, you know, whether it's ice time, it's line mates, it's opportunity, whatever, however you want to look at it. And then it's going worse. And by the way, players like, farther down the lineup like you know i would have experienced it's hard to produce from the third line when you're not on the first power play unit it gets harder when you're in those spots so i a cumulative frustration for me yeah i don't know if he knows himself as a hockey player from the moment he put on skates to not being the guy that is supposed to produce 
not to be like, looked at to as me, the to guy. To me, it would feel like a fish out of water for him right now that he's asked to do something that has never been asked from him in his entire life of being a hockey mm. player, and that is uh, don't worry about scoring right now. Just make good, sound defensive plays and don't cheat for offense, and we're good. You know, part of it could be that he wants to show that he understands that role and he can play it well and be the reliable guy. And so yeah. when he makes a mistake like that, it hurts even more because he's like, ah, you know, I'm supposed to be doing this one thing and, and that's not working. So and you've mentioned it before multiple times. You said about him putting on skates and being expected to produce. It's not even just the expectations. Every team he's been on, he's not been one of the, if he's not the best player, he's the second best player mm-hmm. on every single team he's ever been on in his entire life. And that's just not, he's not the fifth best player on this team right now. Like, it's just, it's, it looks a lot different for him. Yeah. And I'm sure it's tough to come to grips with. Self-identity issues. And then like, you know, if you've won the cup and taken a lower role or something, you might be able to be like, all right, I've played different parts. I've done different things, whatever. But this, this is unique for him in his career. So yeah, all eyes on him adjusting. And we've heard from Sheldon talk about his kind of new role and John's going to do whatever it takes for Mm -hmm. the team to win and you know john understands and john's this and john's that and john's in there going oh hold on for a second i don't want to be that (laughs) what what does that mean john's gonna what next you know go on long-term ir come up with a sore back no you know what's hard now is like well i'm just sitting there going you just played a, a team that's lost Mark Stone for the end of the season and now put themselves in a position to go get Gensel. What just happened on this show? Ben? Okay. Is that you see uh, Gensel? No, well, listen, Vegas dial not... back three okay, days. Okay, right, let's backtrack. Let's backtrack. I have, I have no, yeah. okay. no information yeah, to suggest okay. that Mark Stone's situation isn't legit. Right. Okay. But, is it like a lacerated spleen? That seems legit. But... Yeah. It is. Uh, it, there, there is something comforting to know now. You have the freedom to go get, yes, maybe a eight or nine million dollar player. Right. Definitely. Yes. I. I see. I'm yeah. Picking up what you're putting down yeah. there. It That's would, all. It would work. That's all. I, do you think that would happen? What's that? Surprise is fine. He's fine. He's fine. His coach okay. Said his he's fine. fine. So he's not. His <laughs> fine. Hey. Does his hey. appendix hurt him or something like? <laughs> Would, would it change the trade deadline between now and uh, March 8th if Tavares came down with a sore back? Yes, it would. Oh, tremendous. my God, Kipper. But what's going unless on? Unless you here? think that Do might happen. Do you think happen. this is going to happen? No, I don't think okay, it's going to happen. Okay, okay, okay. I okay. absolutely don't. Okay. What I th- but, but, if, okay, well, but if you're. Hey, but if you're in the, the mindset of John would do whatever it takes for the, to help the team win. Then I mean he would be really fresh coming back after could, 25 games. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I'm on hey, board if he, with that if plan. He's if he's sore, to execute it. Yeah. If he's sore, but he's not. He's 34 years old. There's a lot of wear and tear. You can find any legitimacy to shut a guy down for a little while. You know what's way more likely to happen than that is that they put him back on the second line with Willie and, Nylander, back on the power play, and he plays more ice time. That's way more likely to happen. And I just agree. for the record here, this isn't. Uh, this isn't me pointing a finger at Vegas or the Toronto Maple Leafs. This is me pointing oh, a finger at the system. Well, I mean, that's that's left it wide open yeah. for this crap to happen. Yes. Do it. If it's a possibility, do it. It's not even people are like, yeah, if he ain't cheating, you're not trying or whatever. It's like not even cheating anymore. It's like it's March. The trade deadline is so late. Was it March 8th and the season yeah. ends April 15th or it, something? You got to go five weeks without a guy? Teams do, do it's that just, all the time. It's turned into like... The luxury tax for the NBA. Yeah. They've used it they as like the, the yes, player. for the, it's the luxury tax. And you go above it for the playoffs. Um, yeah. Anyways. Get a lot of texts here about, uh, this, can I read this text? Please. Uh, after all the mistakes last night, Morgan Riley is minus four and we blame John yeah. Tavares for the loss. Well. We're not blaming John I Tavares. Know. Who blamed no, John Tavares? Not. It just, we're talking Sandy's about Tavares. Frustrated. The I know. Yeah. I know. I'm just saying. Now, the Riley Brody duo. Yeah. Was- uh, okay, can I just. Okay. Sorry. Just uh, one more touch on John Tavares, yeah, and to the point where this guy is, um, I'm with you sometimes. That you got to look at a bigger picture. The Leafs are down two one. They get the Bertuzzi goal, mm. right? Yeah. And I think I'm thinking worst case scenario, you're getting out of the period down two one. Mm-hmm. 
And Sheldon goes and he puts Tavares on a line with Matthews and Marner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why? Because he oh, wants to tie it 2-2. Right. Okay. okay. And yet you go down 3-1. Mm-hmm. Like, for, for me, that's, that's Sheldon chasing it, right? And I, I, I didn't... I didn't think it was the right time for him to now load up and try to get that second goal before the end of 40 minutes. I, you know, I can't, that makes yeah. no sense to me, Kip, what you're talking about. Like, to me, it's like they're, you're better with Tavares than no, you're not. a rookie on the no, ice. No, you're not. No, you're not. And that goal proved it. Tavares had, where was Tavares? He's a left I mean, winger. He's in the, he's playing, playing the low. Result. He's better than Matthew No, nice. he's not. I'm Def- putting Holmberg in there. A big, strong guy. I'm getting out of the period down 2-1 and regrouping. I'm not trying to tie the score. You think Holmberg is a better player than John Tavares? In his own zone, 100% on the left wing. So you're defending a 2-1 trail? Like, what's the plan yeah, here? You're I, I, trying to I'm, catch I, up. I, I don't want to give up the third goal. I'm not trying to chase That's a goal. That's playing the result to me. You're playing the result. Yeah, it didn't work no, out. He made a bad yeah, turnover. I didn't like the change. Yeah. I didn't like the change. All you're telling me is by loading up Tavares with Marner and 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 uh, Matthews is you're trying to score the next goal. For sure. You are. Think defense first. You're out of your mind. You're losing. Yeah. Listen, I will say, I wrote an article today, sportsnet.ca, and I made the case you're making right now, which is generally the Leafs have a hard time thinking that, okay, when they're chasing the game, there's still time. So to that point, I agree. I agree with loading up your good players when you're behind trying to win whatever. But God, I think too often the Leafs are like, you know, they got 15 minutes left in the game. They're like, we got to, you know, throw everything at this problem where sometimes some patience would help. Max Domi, they're down 3-1, yeah. 10 minutes left. To me, patience. He, he tries to tip one out of the zone, and instead of stopping, he keeps going. It's yeah. not the time yet to get desperate. So I agree with the idea that some patience is okay. I don't think putting good players on the yeah. ice is, goes. But he's been doing. He does that. He does that a lot of periods in the season where he'll load up the top line for the last minute of the game. It's kind of like one of his things. You know, he you're does. Rest it's after. okay. Last he minute does. of the game. Yeah. No, he does it. He does it in the last minute of the period. You're talking about. And he, yeah, he does it a lot. Yes, he does like. it a lot. And it was just to me yeah. that's a fine time to do it. Tavares, the, the, the and goal sunk the whole game. It did, but it took the energy right out. Yeah, and you had sure. it with Bertuzzi's goal. And again, for me, anyways, that that situation would have been take the momentum off the Bertuzzi goal into the into the uh, dressing room to regroup on a on a period you you weren't really thrilled with to I begin guess, with. I guess I think you're in big big trouble if you think Tavares can't score you offense and now you can't play him because you're worried about his defense. All of a sudden, you're no, just going, just in that situation, yeah. just in that scenario where you're asking him now. Uh, to to play the left wing, mm-hmm. and he ends up being in the opposite corner, acting like a centerman. You better hope he likes the left wing. <laughs> you don't you don't see him Some back at center as a second line guy when this is all said and done. Last year they get O'Reilly and he plays left wing to start playoffs. Right? Is that you know, or towards yeah. that or after po- the trade deadline? Anyway, yeah. you want to stay on uh, Sheldon Keefe and and talk about. Uh, as long him, as we him, also get to hand it this. Him, him getting tossed? Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right. What do you, so, Sam, do you know Sam's in trouble on, on the internet? I think Sam's always in trouble. I know, but his yeah. his thing on Leafs talk, what'd you say? Well, I just said that he's giving me Nick Nurse vibes. Just Keith with how is. much, yeah, Keith is. Just how much he's always on the refs. And I, I think the refs last night were not particularly great. But it just feels like no matter how they are, you hand to the bench and he's just screaming at him and we've mentioned this before in the show it's what good does it do to do it every single night mm-hmm. and it just it feels you know there's a perception amongst Leaf fans that they're the, the refs are out to get the Leafs and I don't know if this is a perception among all fan bases maybe it's thing but like they're 29th in the league and penalties drawn this year and, and every it, year and every year and people think it's that there's an anti-leaf bias yeah. of some sort. Yeah, that's a, that 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 is definitely out there. That 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 but perception or yeah. that actual thing. That perception for sure. And I actually, you know, the Paris the Paris one, people were getting bent out of shape about. I actually can kind of, I I I'm with that one a bit. Mm-hmm. Like in terms of him hating the Leafs, like I'll hear that. Kind of, I will not hear. Like, do you really think that the refs have a 
huge thing together. They're like, we're going to screw the Leafs. Like, do they have meetings? Like, I, I just, I don't know how people actually believe. And I'm a Leaf fan. And I don't yeah. want to dump on my Leaf fan brethren, but it drives me crazy. There's no way it's a thing. It's like, it's a product of the way they've played forever. I what agree. is a thing, though, is general, generally speaking as a, as an official's team, they know who the jerks or the smart yeah, asses jerseys are. Aside, or Sheldon could they, coach they, Arizona they've got a, and they might they've still got a him. list of who they'd rather talk to or deal with and who treats them with respect and who doesn't. Yeah. And I would imagine Sheldon's, you know, somewhere, you know, on, on the side of, can't we get this guy just to shut up once? Coach is, is going to keep his mouth shut. It's such a boy who cried wolf thing. Because, like, if you yell at them all the time, they're just like, we don't know if you're actually upset or if this is just another thing. I, I do think it's hilarious that Garrett Rank shipped him. Like, I, that's, oh, I think that it's is hilarious he, that he didn't give him a penalty. He no, just told him to go the, home. Uh, the, the officials got a bit of a reputation for, for, for doing that Rank as does. well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, like, I thought, you never see that. That yeah. never happens in a hockey game. Listening to him. Like it happens all the time in baseball. It's one of my favorite things in the sport. I got, but. Yeah, I got two sides to this. I can play both sides as as far as the official goes. Just the, the game's over. There's a couple minutes left. Just suck yeah. it up. The Sheldon's not going to fight anyone. Skin. Yeah, you're Let right. Let him rant. Go on. Just yeah. turn your back and drop the puck. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you need to? Uh, and actually, Sheldon was extremely calm at the time he got ejected. I understand that yeah, he had not a, been It was calm. the 10 minutes prior to that yeah, that yeah. probably sent him over the edge. Right. So that's my first thought. Yeah. My second one is also, Sheldon, just give it a rest. Yeah. The game's over, Sheldon. It's 5-2. Yes, it was a horrible call. It was a phantom call. But the Bad game call. is over. Yeah. Okay? And that's not the reason why you lost. No. Let's listen to Sheldon on clip two is, here on Getting Talk. Listen up. Take us through what led to your Achilles No. Okay. No. In terms of things that you said to the refs in the past, like, right. where did... Right. Not going there. Not going there. Literally wouldn't even do it, eh? Nope. Won't engage the conversation? That sucks. Dude. There is, no. for every coach, there is a method to the madness on when... And how to do it. Yeah. Okay. You think Sheldon's got a method or? No. no. I, he didn't have one last night. I agree. He was just off the cuff. Yeah. It served no purpose. You got to build something up. So at the most critical point, either the regular season or in the playoffs, you can play a few of those cards. Mm -hmm. Last night was a waste. A complete waste Game's of getting over. thrown out. Yeah. And that's that's the part where Sheldon's got to still needs to figure it out. Is that there's a time and place where you need the next call, so you're going to say certain things either on the bench or through the media, and that's again intertwined with your general manager and your president. And last night just served no purpose to being thrown out. When the score is 5-2 and the game is yeah. over. I know in baseball there's like strategic ejection, ejections where the managers yeah. are like, I'm going to show my team, I'm going to go to the wall for them on this one. It doesn't really happen in hockey. you know. You, and you see the clip of Willie kind of being like... Well, Willie was like, hey, hey, you know, chill out. We don't need this right now. So, yeah, I, that, that wasn't the case last night. I agree that there didn't seem to be a plan. <sighs> he is an emotional guy. And well, like... You just won seven in a row. Yeah. It's not like if you lost seven in a row and then again, you've got all this pent up yeah. frustration and you need to send a message to either your team or the other team or the Does officials it send a or something. That you care that you, you know, you genuinely just care about every two points. Won seven in a row. You've played your best hockey in the last two weeks. Yeah. You what? Like, no, you, you no, that's the, not the time. There's other ways to show that. But, that's not in that instance. But he's one of those guys, and I can tell you from working with him, that even when you win a bunch, it's not take your foot off the gas because we're having success time. He wants to keep slamming it to the floor. And you can say what you will about yeah. that. It hasn't well, produced Well, judging you know, by results. Willie's uh, reaction, uh, you better be careful with that. that. That stuff tires out players, man. They don't need to hear that all the time. I'm with you. And, like, I, I forget what game it was in the streak, but they 
scream, that's on you at the ref because they called like a penalty and they're up in the game. It's like, man, just. Yeah. Too, like we all watch a lot of hockey. Not every coach is doing this every game. No. And it feels like it's every game with Keith. That's it's actually my funny. Point. The coaches who have won a lot in the NHL, you don't see them do it much at all. John Cooper, hardly ever. Joel, this is John Cooper. Yeah. Joel Quenville, you know, was like that. I know even like Paul Maurice had that big epic rant in Toronto that kind of turned their season around. That wasn't even at the refs. It was at his players. But that's what made it meaningful is it was eighth players. But also it was uncommon mm -hmm. to see Maurice red-faced and losing his mind, right? So yeah. it has value. So maybe he'll get there. Okay. Uh, we don't need to... The Marner penalty was a goofy miss by the officials, and it was it looked to me did, like did his spit was there. The I don't know. It doesn't did. even... It doesn't really matter. Yeah. I'm, I'm not... It was a bad call. It was a bad call. But the stick was near the leg. Guys go down. It's a fast game, but, like, it's a bad call. It's a bad you, call. You get why he's mad. Big deal. For sure. All right. Uh, the lefties. The lefties. I thought the it was D. a major problem. I thought it was a major problem last night. Well, I, uh, yeah. And then factor in that Lilligren was starting to look good, mm -hmm. and now you've lost him, and right back to kind of that feeling of Brody. Dude, Brody, brutal. On the right side. Like, when he went back on pucks, he turned three over below their goal line in the first period where he just, if he were a right shot, he could have just put it up the wall and he kind of gets jammed and tries to make backhand plays or whatever. And it just, it's a problem. And I know we've said they need a right-hand shot. And I, I know that's part of the plan. But it can't be, is it Nick Steeler who they really like but who happens to be a left shot as well? Like, it can't be a left shot. It can't be Noah Hannafin. No, it has to be a right hand. It has to be yeah. a right shot. It just there. You're already going to have McCabe at the very least playing his offside. You're already have to play Lilligren because you just don't have right shots. So that is something to watch as they move towards the deadline. That it has to be at least one right hand shot. Once you get out of the coming off a West Coast trip and running out of gas in the second and the third period, there was the part of the game last night where you watch. The, the Vegas Golden Knights blue line, and you go, that's a playoff team. Well, that that D blue line D. put on a clinic last night. And then as, as, as much as you want to get excited about the Leafs the last two weeks, you watch them looking behind them going, oh, oh, that's a breakaway. Oh, mm. I wonder if he scores. Like, that stuff doesn't happen when Vegas is on, right? Yeah. Like, but that, I mean, they're, they're not looking behind themselves. That Petrangelo last night was a stud beyond belief. Best player in the rink. Like, a clinic yeah. that guy put on, yeah. on on how to play defense and how to compete for a Stanley Cup. Mm -hmm. No, you're going to say that they just hung seven on yeah. him or whatever. They yeah. did. However. Just beat the crap out of him. They did. Less than a week ago. But I think this was a... You know, they Vegas did get embarrassed at home and sure. they, they had, you know, done their scouting and all that against the Leafs. And I think they came in with a little bit more of a snarl and an, an intention to defend. Mm -hmm. And I watched a lot of video. I tr almost treated today like a uh, like a video coach. And the amount of times that the Leafs had almost opportunities that there's layers of golden knights in front of the net, getting a poke, getting a mm -hmm. stick, slowing down the hands on a shot. Well, like, they just couldn't get any play, clean look. The play Shea Fedor made on Marner when he was shorthanded mm -hmm. and he had a step on him. He just had the stick, got the body position when he likes to do that tap back pass. Yeah. He just got the stick out there, poked it off his stick. Like Shea Theodore, I think he had three assists last night. He was all over the place too. It's a good decor. No question. Nicholas Haig. Like yeah. here's a guy he that they pick up in the second round. He's six, seven. That big? Six, seven. That's so tall. <laughs> and this, I, th I think he scored like 30 goals in, in, in junior. Really? Like this guy can actually score too. Yeah. And yet he's not asked to be like a, a power play type of guy. Right. But like this is a this is a Stanley Cup contending blue line. Well, it's, it better be because their forward group's not very good. No, it's no not. they were they, they they played with structure and discipline yeah. last night without two of their best players. Yeah, without two of their best. I mean, without the two guys, they're not very good. With the two guys, they barely have enough offense. But like their their decor is so good that to yeah. me, any time they yeah. always have a chance. The Leafs last night had five grade-A scoring opportunities. Yeah, yeah. They've all, total. Oh, total? Total. Felt like they were in the first five minutes of that game. Yeah, yeah. and they're only uh, only three other times this year have they like, had fewer than that. Austin didn't get 
Aside. Hardly any looks. He like had that. like nine attempts and one shot. Like they were all, all over, over in his range. Anytime he and it reminded me of playoffs when the Leafs scored two seven straight games where the guys got to good spots. Matthews yeah. too. Like remember he got to the slot on the power play on a break and he takes a pass from Marner. There's always a stick there. And you know, that's something they're gonna have to overcome is figuring out how to play against very good defenses. Teams that have better defense than uh Vegas in terms of uh goals against totals, Boston. Florida and the Rangers. Oh, great! Yeah. All three of them. Need to play any of those guys? <laughs> Definitely one of them. Don't Although quite, Detroit might pass the lead. It's going to be interesting here, guys, because like outside of I think ten of, uh, I don't know where you go. Like, are you are you going to be okay with uh, Edmondson coming? Uh, Lushkin. Nick Jensen's name I hear from Washington, right-handed shot. He's I got get, years on his deal. Yeah. That's a name I'm starting to hear. Mm-hmm. Is that is that going to be enough? I don't know. Like, can you do something out of the box? Like, I know we kind of shot down Borgen and Adam Larson yesterday, but, like, can you pay a little more and get someone who actually really works in that spot? Because you're right. The, the list is not it's David Savard's and, you know, a lot of those type of yeah. butchers. All in. We're all out. There is no in-between. I I can't, for the life of me, let last night shake my belief. But, boy, it was hard to watch that and not be like, oh, maybe they're playing bad teams. No, 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 they're they're actually good. Like, it was a tough performance to watch. I'll say this. Thursday night, need a bounce-back drubbing against the Coyotes. Put you right back on track, Sammy. Yes. Okay, let's take a quick break. When we return, Steve Valiquette, analyst for the New York Rangers on MSG. He'll help us uh, tee up that game. Yeah, we're, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves as the Leafs will face Arizona tomorrow night, but they also have the New York Rangers Saturday night, which means... We, ding, so we ding, just ding, like ding, Valley, ding. all right? Yeah. What's that? So we just like Valley. Yeah, this is the time, we this like is Valley. A, this is the time Valley could do, so we're like, let's just make it work. So there we go. That's and perhaps a heavyweight title match Saturday oh, yeah. night as well. M.P. Reeve. We'll ask Round one. Valley that as well. When we return on Real Kipper and Born, we just love our next guest to the point where we'll just like, okay, when's he available? When can we get him? Right? <laughs> Work around his schedule. And it's not even like, it. it's not even now we go to Steve Aliquette for just like goaltending stuff. We want anything yeah. that we can get out of the guy. So that's Wait, why we're. suits. Why we're <laughs> nice stuff. <laughs> is it a canali? What's going on? That's Actually, why we're this is a Canadian company. This is Copley. Oh, oh very lovely. nice. Known yeah. well up here. But we don't, yeah, you know what? what we we didn't bring you on for fashion, bud. <laughs> yeah, bring Henrik on for that. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into some goaltending, uh, which is right up your alley, I'm I'm going with the the heavyweight tilt tonight. Uh, between Columbus and the Rangers and the and the Rempe um, phenomenon. Is that what's going on? Love to hear your angle of his past week. And and w- is there anything in your career that you can compare this to a teammate or, you know, something from afar? Like, the story has been yeah. incredible in the last week, Valley. Uh, sorry, lights just went out on me here. I'm in an old office at the uh, MSG Networks, but if, as long as you guys can still see me, we're good, pal. You're good. We're swinging it back on. But here's what I remember: uh, Colton Orr. When I worked, when I was with Orzy, we had, uh, geez, we had Yager, we had Shanahan, Chris Drury, Scott Gomez, we had Straka. So we had a lot of guys that uh, needed room out there to perform. And I remember Orzi on the bench before games, just yelling at the other team, saying, if you guys even sneeze on any of these guys, I'm coming after you. And they were getting room. And Orzi at one point, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, probably haven't. There was a rumor going around the NHL that he impl- uh, implanted a metal plate in his fist in the off season. And that's why he was knocking everybody out. So into that season, he had beaten up a few guys. I remember one in particular was Todd Fedorik, his orbital bone uh, broke. We were set to play against the Islanders on the weekend, and we had heard from their group that they wanted an X-ray to prove that Colt Nord didn't have a steel plate in his hand. <laughs> and they weren't going to let him play unless we could prove it. So Orzi has to send an X-ray to Gary Bettman and to Garth Snow to prove that he doesn't Come have a on. metal plate in his hand. 
And yeah, oh yeah. So we're in the locker room together. We're good buddies. And I'm like, Orzy, you gotta send it with the middle finger. So he sent it with the the X-ray to the to the commissioner. And he, oh, it was the best. And he signs it to me. He goes to Valley when a myth becomes a legend. And this was something that was taking on a life of its own. And I remember everybody coming to the games not to see the goals, but to see what Colt Nord was going to do next. I'm seeing this for a second time with Rempe and. Look, guys, he's even grown since he's been here. He's been here five games. He was listed at six, seven. Now he's six, eight and a half. Like he's just knocking everybody out, but it's been a little bit reckless. And I'm talking to Nick Fatiu on the way over here. He gives me a call. I'm just about to get on the train and we're talking about how to lock up an elbow. And Nicky's one of my all time favorites. He was my coach in the minor leagues and I see him often. I speak to him often. And we were just talking about picking your spots and maybe not letting everybody know that you're going to fight the next guy. And if Olivier wants to fight tonight, do you let him know in warm up or do you let him think about it a little bit? And I'll tell you what, guys, just to wrap this up, it's it's hard for me, too, because I lost another friend two weeks ago, Scott Page. He was the first captain of the Mississauga Ice Dogs and Steve Montador. Uh, those two guys were my best men at my wedding. So I'm looking at my wow. pictures in my office of my two best men that are no longer with us. CT was the factor in, in both of their deaths. And I have a hard time seeing a young 21 year old go in there and just go guns a blazing without protecting himself too. And part of me, part of me hopes he doesn't play tonight, to be honest. And he was pretty wobbly uh, on Sunday after getting hit with a couple from Olivier. Valley. Very well said. Mm -hmm. And um, the difference between my generation and his right now is that that awareness. So let me ask you something. Uh, who who in that dressing room can pull him on the side and 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 talk to him and 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 get him to understand the risks and you can't keep this pace and you need to work on your game, your skating, your forechecking, your energy. Who is yeah. that? Is that Truba? Is that someone in the Truba. front office? Is it Nikki Fatio, yeah. who we all love? Yeah, exactly. Look, I'm I'm watching. Just coincidentally, I'm watching Ice Guardians last night. My parents are visiting from Nova Scotia. My dad likes the old school stuff. So, but look, Eric Goddard's in that, uh, who's had some issues post retirement with stuff, and and he's a really good friend of mine. Lived in my house in Bridgeport. Colt Noor, a very good friend of mine. Brian McGratton, I was a roommate with for two years. I've always been around the enforcers, Kipper, because um, we're the only two guys that can get embarrassed, the goaltender and the enforcer. And oftentimes in a locker room, especially the backup goalie, is very close with the enforcers because there's there's a, there's a piece there that you, you share a bond. Now, is it Jonathan Quick that talks to him? You know, because there's a guy that's been around, you know, and you want to, and it's for sure it's Jacob True, but he's the lieutenant on this team. And this team all of a sudden overnight got tough. You know, like this is a, this is a group that can play Florida now. And you don't want to waste it in the regular season. You have to save a piece for what's going to be coming in the playoff playoffs. So Valley, how do you, how do you feel about, fighting now in the way obviously it's backed off considerably from when you played but given how closely you've been affected by it but also as an analyst of the game and recognizing the value that it can bring to a team when you have someone who suddenly creates room for your team like that you know when you watch this it must be a conflicting feeling it is big time i have a hard time with it right now i saw steve monitor guys i, I spent a week with him in his basement you know and this was a flight from Milford, Connecticut to Chicago. I, I could hear it in his voice. I lived it. We were best friends since we were teenagers. Greatest person, best teammate. He'd fight for you guys in a second. Uh, Scott Page, I remember him in junior. We played together for the Sudbury Wolves. He's my best friend. And his face looked like a roadmap. And we would celebrate it. Yeah. And I feel so stupid for it now. But, you know, that's what we grew up with. Now, there's a piece of me that, yes, it's still a big part of the game. The, the intimidation factor, it's there. You need it. Now, can we do it smartly? Meaning, just as we're talking about here, you know, Rempe, you don't have to fight Olivier again tonight. You could take a night off. You're not going to fight 82 times next season. Mm -hmm. So oh, I have a hard time with it, man. I, I really do. I, I don't even know what to say. Look, yeah. uh, Chris Nowitzki, who's at the BU uh, Institute where – brains are sent when somebody passes away. He was my first phone call the morning I found out two weeks ago. It's the second time I've had to call him in five years for one of my best friends. You know, he's like, Steve, not again. 
You know, and I'm like, yeah, Chris. Yeah, that's heavy. You know, and then if they really get his brain in uh, less than 24 hours, it'll be looked at and, and we'll find out in six months uh, from BU. Well, Valley, we, we certainly appreciate your candid thoughts on this topic, and it's one that we could probably do for an hour or two on its yeah. own. But um, there's more to our conversation in this Leaf edition, including Samsonov having, you know, a, a decent run since coming back uh, all-star break and a, kind of reestablishing himself. And uh, going into last night, I think a 9-2 and two record. But, and here's the but, um, the Leafs now are in a situation where Joseph Wall's back. The thought is maybe he gets in on the weekend, but then you've got the three-headed monster with Martin Jones. So just give us your yeah. overall thoughts on a three-headed monster in general or how it pertains to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, the three-headed monster never works. I've been in it before. <laughs> uh, there's two nets in practice. One guy isn't getting work. Um, here's the thing. I, I watched the game last night, and... I didn't like goal number one, which was a breakaway. And you yeah. might say, well, it was a breakaway. Yeah, but here's the problem. I don't know if Samsonov's game's a great fit for Toronto because Toronto does give up a lot of breakaways. Uh, 28th in the NHL in breakaways against, okay? Samsonov, only one goaltender has a worse save percentage in the NHL on breakaways. So it's not a good fit. You're playing goal for a team that gives up a lot of breakaways. That's bad. And you see the first goal, and you, you have to watch it through, I guess, a goalie lens a little bit. But typically, you step out, you challenge, you stride back one, two. You've got some glide so you can finish with your save above the post. And all he does is come out and get really wide and open, and that puck goes through him. So it's it's just not a good goal from that perspective. But look, goal number three was the backbreaker, and it's a one-timer. And, and this is something that you would know from scouting Vegas. That's what they look for. As soon as the puck gets below the goal line with Vegas, they always have their F3 looking for a one-timer from the slot. They don't jam the net. They're not going to crash the net and create chaos. They're looking for that guy moving. And Carlson's a lefty. And what if you look at it again from uh, the goalie perspective, Samsonov's job when the puck goes to the corner, it is to scan the middle and find out who is a threat there. And you would know that Vegas is looking for it, so that should be something that's at the top of your mind. When the puck goes to the corner, guys, and there's a, there's a battle, and it's either nobody's puck or uh, nobody's gotten to it yet, that's always your window to take a look. Check the front. Check the front. What do I have? Oh, lefty. Lefty, okay, one-timer. And now when the pass comes across, I can track it to a lefty. That should be a pretty routine save. But he allows the puck to get ahead of him, and it's a five-hole shot that he's trying to charge because he didn't do the work before the shot. Mm -hmm. Playing goal, it's a lot like a defenseman. The harder you work before retrieving a puck out of a corner for a defenseman, or the harder I work as a goalie to locate the next threat, not the guy in the corner that's got the puck, the easier my save is or the easier as a defenseman would make a first pass. I just don't think he's doing the work before the shot. How much of difficulty um, is for a goaltender in Toronto? Is it just like, I guess, how much is on the goalie and how much is on the defense? Because I look at goaltenders who have success and they tend to play behind pretty good decors. We've had Car Carter Hutton on saying that when he played for the Blues, it was so much easier than when he played for the Sabres based on the quality of the defenses like sure. this. Leafs decor is not elite. How much harder do they make it on the goaltenders? Yeah, Borny, like, listen, you guys know I listen to you guys, and I know that you're aware that the Leafs were a very good defending team two years ago, mm. three years ago. And now they've lost it, but not lost it to a degree where it's really problematic. Um, breakaways, as I said, 28th. Rebounds, 22nd. And two goals last night were off rebounds. Yeah. Uh, screens, 22nd. And actually, that's one of... Uh, the biggest weaknesses in Samsonov's game as well is off screens. Uh, there was a screen deflection goal last night, and it's so easy to dismiss. You can say, oh, well, you know, it was screened and deflected. Yeah, but you still don't see what would make him successful, which is shift over on your feet, get big, get behind it, build a wall, rather than reaching. Look how small I am here. Benoit Allaire would say this all the time. Your arms separated from your body. This goes in, this goes in. It could hit you in the middle of the chest and go in. Mm -hmm. It's nothing. You've got, to have, you've got to have actually the width of a puck uh, off your elbows. Imagine that I'm in my goalie stance and I can hold a puck off my elbow and hip on both sides. That's that's the distance, three inches. But he's out here, and it's it makes him small, and it makes him leaky. Look, Samsonov's had his difficulty. I don't think... If it's 
No, I don't think you guys should run with him. Look, man, I'm a Leaf fan. I'm on the show because I, listen, I, I want the, if the Rangers don't win, I want the Leafs to win. Well, we go. could have a round one matchup here. This could very legitimately be Leafs Rangers. It'd be awesome. We could do a daily show, boys. Hey, listen, we'll have you on. I promise. Valley, I, <laughs> I love watching you guys when I'm on. Thanks, pal. Yeah, you're very Doug McLean. Yeah. Let me ask you something. In your career, how many times did you look out from your cre crease and see six? left-handed shots on your blue line and is it that big of a deal once puck drops it's still noticeable to you with the action moving do you actually sit there and go yeah i wish this blade would have been on the other side uh nowhere i noticed it kipper was guys boxing out mm. because they can't get under on the right side so a righty a righty defenseman in front of me when the puck is walking across the top he gets to go under you and push you like this Whereas the lefty finds a hard time getting around and it gives him a hard, it gives me like a layered screen when it should be an easy lane. Interesting. Hey, yeah. by the way, that's the screens. Look at the screens number. Uh, what did I say? 22nd, right? Yeah. 22nd in screens allowed. I bet you if you looked at where those screens are coming from, it's from the goaltender's right side. That's, I mean, awesome. I know we have to get going quick, but I do want to ask about the Rangers goaltending. Um, you know, the defensive numbers in New York look really good. I think they're the sixth best team in terms of goals against in the league. How much credit do the goalies deserve versus their defense score? Yeah, so, uh, so they've been giving up a lot of shots. Five, uh, five straight games with 40 or more shots against, but wow. it's been a lot of low-calorie fluff, like a lot of long shots. And it's so funny because that's when Shesterkin plays his best. Yeah, if You get this guy. Philadelphia on the weekend, they had 30 low danger shots, and he's just out there. Every time he gets a great A, it just looks routine. Uh, he's won his last six games. Over the last month, he's 10 goals better than expected. That's best in the league. The guy's wow. back. He looks amazing right now. His last legit, like the only time he didn't look good was the um, stadium series game where it was a little leaky, but maybe uh, some glare. I don't know. That's what I heard. Valley, you telling me this story about Colton Orr and that steel plate in his glove story, and I'm so mad at myself that I, I didn't, didn't think, think of to it. Do it. Didn't think of it myself. <laughs> oh yeah, Orzy loves it. He loves every time I bring it up too. He texts me right away. So hopefully he'll pick this up or I'll, I'll send. That's it over an all-time story. I cannot believe I haven't heard that. Oh, he's the best. Yeah. And I got the I got the X-ray to prove it. I'll I'll maybe post that sometime. That was buddy. Hilarious. You're the best. <laughs> you're the best on our show. Thanks for doing this. Hey, anytime, fellas. Take Thanks, care. Steve Alicat. What up? Oh, he's so good. Is he off the air? <laughs> no. I don't want did. him to hear that. He did, for sure. I he's mean, so good. Between the personal notes, the, the right. goaltending stuff, the Colton Orr story, that's a no, new Hall the, of Fame. The, the, the boxing out on the left yeah, and the right-handed right shot. The boxing out, I didn't even think it's, of that. It's stuff that you, you know, you go to the net and you just roll off of guys yeah, and you know what side you're going to roll off of. and But you don't, I mean, for him to... Uh, articulated on our show I, I just he's awesome hof interview i agree join Cobb's bread this saturday march 2nd for donation day where two dollars from every six pack of their hot cross buns uh sold will be donated to over a hundred local canadian charities with a target goal of over half a million dollars to celebrate we're giving away a hundred dollar Cobb's bread gift card all week to enter text the daily code word to 59590 today's code word is one of their hot cross bun flavors cranberry orange Text Cranberry Orange to 59590 right now for your chance to win. Cobb's Bread bakes fresh in-house all day, every day. And when their doors close, all the leftover baked goods are donated to local charities. The next morning, they start fresh, baby. It's a Cranberry Orange. Text Cranberry Orange to 59590. That sounds good. So there you go, boys. They're lemon blueberry scones. That, that, was, that was one of the greatest segues from steel plates and hockey gloves <laughs> to, hot to hot cross, cross buns. buns you'll hot ever cross get. buns. I used to play that song in the recorder. Hot cross buns. That's unbelievable <laughs> stuff. All right. Our thanks to Steve Alicat, analyst for the New York Rangers and one of our favorites here on Real Kipper and Born. We're just getting started here. We go national next. What do we have? Cody Hodgson. Cody Hodgson. Yeah. Oh, my, oh, my oh, winger. On. My Thursday morning <laughs> winger. Eight years. He's up next. Welcome back into the Real Kipper and Bourne Show. This is our national edition of our show. We are live on Sportsnet and Sportsnet 650 in Vancouver. Sportsnet 960 in Calgary. This hour of Real Kipper and Bourne brought to you by Bet365. Nick Kiprios, Justin Bourne.
Sammy McKee. Relatively quiet night in the National Hockey League tonight. Mm -hmm. Oilers and the Blues and the Rangers and the Blue Jackets. And for some reason, I think more of the attention might be off Connor McDavid and company tonight. and Maybe more on a six-round draft pick <laughs> who just got called up about a week ago, JB. Matt Rempe is, uh, played four NHL games, I believe. He has fought three and a half times. The, the one time he left someone so bloodied with a hit that no one really wanted to fight him. It's been a, a whirlwind for him coming out of the gates. The last guy he fought was uh, Matthew Olivier, who punched his eye just about closed. I don't know if you've seen a picture of Rempe yeah. since, but he's struggling a bit. Um, we talked with Steve Valiquette in the last hour, uh, covers the Rangers, about Rempe and his thoughts on his fighting they play this team again like is he gonna fight this guy again yeah. the guy who just punched him in he's it's a little much kip for those of you just joining our show uh here at the top of the hour uh we did have steve aliquette on earlier and if you get a chance download that and and have a listen because usually we talk to valley and it it's around the the numbers of the goalies and you know the overall uh, view of uh of what he sees outside the crease, but he talked about um, fighting and uh, the, the closeness that he's had uh, with teammates uh, yeah. who some have lost his, their lives. Steve Monitor and Steve Page. Steve Monitor, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's, 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 it's really compelling stuff. Give it a listen. Um, we do have another guest, though, before we, we have time to finish that convo. So I'm going to let you tee it up. All right. Our next guest is a guy who I'm, I want to take a little credit for. Agent Kipper? Not so much a, a, line agent, mate kipper. <laughs> agent Kipper, line mate Kipper, <laughs> Thursday morning, Eric Lindro skates. Um, you know, we formed a line with myself, Big E, and, and our next guest, uh, Cody Hodgson. And uh, I, I think that's where the, the seed was planted, <laughs> right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Let's welcome in Cody Hodgson from the Milwaukee Admirals, who went eight years between wow. professional hockey goals. Cody, thanks for joining us, man. How are you? You look great. You look better than me, uh, I can tell you. you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel great. No, it's nice to be playing again. And, uh, no, not that I didn't, you know, consider playing with you also playing, but in a professional manner. <laughs> if you're playing with Kip, it is not in a professional manner. So, this no, in all seriousness, how good was our line? I think we were great. You know, you could see why we played. It was nice to reminisce about the old days playing, but uh, no, we had some good chemistry out there. So oh. go ahead. Yeah. No, no, you uh, go so, ahead. so Cody, you, um, you, you had a condition that was associated with some uh, medication you had been taking at the time. For those people who aren't familiar with your story, could you give us the background of how you went from stopping playing in 2016 to being back and, by the way, scoring three times in five games in the American League already? Uh, well, yeah, it's a bit of a crazy story, to be honest. But, um, yeah, I was diagnosed in 2016 with a, a rare muscle condition called malignant hepatothermia. Um, I was having some severe issues. Uh, most people know it as an allergy to anesthesia where your body gets super hot and, uh, you know, things just basically start shutting down. Everything seizes up and um, you trigger this reaction that is fatal. You know, the name malignant means can kill you. And then hyperthermia just means your temperature you know, rises too high. So um, that's what I dealt with while I was playing. And uh, I was told once I once I was diagnosed 100 percent with it, I did the genetic testing first just to try to confirm it wasn't exactly conclusive. So I had to do a muscle biopsy. Mm -hmm. They take a big chunk of your muscle and, and they test it through a bunch of uh, um, yeah, they put through a bunch of tests and then they showed that I had it full for sure. So they said uh, avoid contact sports, avoid prolonged physical activity, avoid going from hot to cold or cold to hot. <laughs> Avoid, uh, you know, high stress environment. Basically, a job description <laughs> of a professional hockey player. <laughs> and they say if you don't do that, you could trigger this thing; it could kill you. So, um, you know, I was having some heart arrhythmia stuff. I was having, uh, you know, my lungs were shutting down. I was urinating blood. I had a whole bunch of issues while I was playing that I had to go to the hospital a couple of times for, just in the emergency room. Um, and it, it really was scary. So, uh, after the the testing, I you know took about four and a half years off. I didn't touch my gear. Um, and then uh, some alumni guys in Nashville, while I was living there, I was working for the Predators. They, uh, they knew I couldn't play hockey and they'd still check up on me every you know, couple of weeks. You're just a really good organization, really good people. Um, and so I decided to stay in Nashville and, and oversee the youth development. I did that for about seven years and, and just played basically hockey once a week. Um, and then I moved home. My brother just had a kid and uh, my other sister was pregnant. So I wanted to be an uncle, moved back to Toronto, started skating a little bit in the summer and 
um, yeah, it kind of took off from there once once I started feeling healthy. Can, can I ask you that stretch of retiring to the point where you went back? Um, was it? Did you ever really have closure? Is this why you, you're you're coming back? Is because you never felt right about uh, the time that you did retire the first time? Yeah, I always wanted to play. You know, I played you know six years, but I always felt like you know a lot of my buddies are still playing and. And it's still, you know, it's the best life. You you want to be out there and competing. And uh, I knew I, I didn't have a chance. I knew, you know, while I was, you know, having these issues and even, you know, in the previous times, if I skated hard, if I was, you know, did a hard workout, I knew my body would seize up. It, it would trigger and I wouldn't be able to do anything for a day or two and have to take these drugs that make you kind of loopy and, and you can't really play on them. So, um, yeah, it was tough. It, it, those four or five years were really tough. I didn't I literally didn't touch my my hockey gear, like my professional stuff, in a long time. And then JP Dumont said, "If you want to come back out and play, it's just alumni guys. No one's there to prove anything, and we just have fun. So if you can't skate, you can't skate, and you just get off. And no one's you know no one's going to try to kill you or anything like that. It's not super competitive. So I loved it. It was good for the soul to be back and they're in the game, being around the dressing room, being around the guys, and um, it was nice and to to allow me to come out and then. From there, started playing yeah once or twice a week, and then when I got back in Toronto, a little more intense skates with with Lindros and Gary Roberts has a skate as well. I joined, and um, they just made you feel comfortable. And but once I started feeling good, it was about midsummer. I I called some of my buddies that uh, were still playing, Cameron Gons, Kevin Carr, and I said, hey, if you guys ever need an extra guy, you know, I'd love to I'd love to jump out there with you guys and, and see what I can do. So I just having fun. I was still I was still two hundred you know thirty five pounds and. <laughs> So I've lost uh, 45 pounds since then, wow. but uh, you know, it was just fun to get back out there and, and compete with them. They were uh, they were still training, like they all wanted to play back in the National Hockey League, and some of them were still playing. So um, just kind of took it from there. Imagine being so good at hockey, you just call up guys and playing pro hockey, be like, "Can I just jump out there a little bit? Like I'm just gonna drop 40 and get back in the mix." So is your <laughs> health condition then is that gone? Is that how looked after? Is it a risk still for you? I mean, I think it's it's a genetic condition, so it's always there. But okay. hopefully, with the with the, the right medication that I have now, and and being able to do these techniques that I've kind of developed over the last little bit, that it hasn't triggered. And I've I've pushed myself harder in the last six months than I have in my entire life, thinking that I would try to trigger it so that you know I wouldn't come back I and then have to it. stop it for two weeks. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so um, no. And luckily, it's been great. I, I we called up the doctors that told me I couldn't play anymore, and I said, please test me for everything. You know, test my lungs, liver, kidney, heart, all that stuff, and. It all came back clean. And then I, I, you know, after skating and, and normally I, like I said, it would be like a couple of days I have to take off, but after skating with the guys that were still playing and I, you know, I tried to come back the next week and then maybe I'd do two skates a week and then started into three and I just kept pushing it and pushing it. And, and then uh, I, I called the doctors again. I said, Hey, I'm going to try to, you know, push this as hard as I can. Can you guys monitor me please? And, and so every week I would send my blood work in the blood tests and, and it's been clean. So um, yeah, knock on wood, nothing nothing comes up, but it, it's been feeling great. We're talking to Cody Hodgson, who's made a remarkable comeback after eight seasons uh, and now is playing in uh, what's still considered, I think, the second best league in the world, the American Hockey and League. And on the best team by a good distance, too. What did you guys, like, have you haven't lost in 19 games or something, 20? <laughs> We just lost on, on the 20th game, unfortunately. But, yeah, the second all-time in AHL history, uh, the streak. That is so awesome. So let me ask you something. Like, eight years, like, a few things have changed. <laughs> Tell me about those first couple of days walking in. It's like you, you get a little Marty McFly thing going, back to the future. Like, what what was noticeable for you that you maybe you noticed that you didn't notice eight years ago? Well, I know no one takes slap shots anymore. That's the first thing everyone kind of told me about. Yeah. There's, this, there's no time in the game, but um, we'll see if I can bring it back. <laughs> the, uh, no, the next thing is just everyone's so talented and skilled and, and fast, but I thought that was going to be the, the biggest adjustment, just the speed of the game. And honestly, the mental side of it, that was probably the most difficult. I, I mean, the first game back, the, I got to give Milwaukee credit, though. The coaches have tried to put me in a situation to succeed, and they didn't put me in the first uh, little bit. I was practicing, trying to get up to speed, and then I got put in a couple games. I broke my rib the first game, like second period, so – Try to play through that for a bit. <laughs> had a bruise long. <laughs> um, the second game uh, was feeling it, but then yeah, I had to shut down for about three weeks, and then uh, just coming back now. That's had to take a little break, but um, that was a nice. Welcome back to pro hockey. Nice broken rib right at, right yeah. at the beginning. Is uh, it? But no. You, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just like, is it being back around pro hockey and the routine of 
you know, travel, morning skate, game, shower. You know, the 3,000 showers per day is something I remember vividly that I was glad to get out of when I was done. Is it like a time warp to be back doing all that again? Yeah, it is. But they, like I said, these guys are this such professionals here. They, they got great food in the mornings. Uh, you know, they got top-notch medical staff. So honestly, it, it feels great. Like, I I don't know uh, what else you need. I, as a hockey player, it's kind of the three days of the week. You know, you get game day, practice day, day off. It makes things real simple. So it, it's weird being back in that environment after, you know, being in the business world sort of uh, in real estate. When I got out of hockey, uh, I started investing in real estate. And so there's, you know, you had to get rid of your naps. That was pretty nice. Getting the, the, the midday nap now. Bring that back, yeah. Uh, how about yeah. How, how about video games with some of the twenty something guys? <laughs> like, yeah. like, what do you guys do all day in Milwaukee? <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't got it back into the video games. I actually never was really into the video games um, when I was doing it. But no, now we're into the the red light therapies, the PEMF, the all the stuff to take care of your body. It's it's changed a little bit. I guess so. You know. What are the aspirations? I mean, obviously, you'd like to get back and play at the highest level, one assumes? Yeah. No, I think anyone who plays it, you know, hockey at a competitive level wants right. to play at the top. So that's my goal. I mean, it might be insane to think about it, but, um, no, that's what I'm pushing for. So, yeah, uh, PTO would be a good start by next September with the National Hockey League Club? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'm just trying to do well with this team. You know, I'm trying to get involved as much as I can and then be part of this. Uh, you know, hopefully we can start another streak, but it's been fun to be around. I really like the coaching staff, the GM. They gave me a chance. When I first called, they're like, uh, you know, that might be a little long. <laughs> I haven't played in eight years. Yeah. But I, I was fortunate. I, I got to talk with, um, I actually called people that, that knew me and knew my character and knew I wasn't just, you know, calling, you know, kind of, you know, in this pipe dream that I was training and, and knew what was going on. But you know, a couple, a uh, couple guys made some phone calls on behalf, which is really nice. And um, I was able to talk to you know, Guy Boucher and, and Terry Chris was a good one in Nashville. I just basically asked him, like, you guys been around the game a long time. How would you try to do this? Or what do you think would be the best way to do this? And they said, you know, it'd be tough to try to convince a team to give you a tryout right away. But maybe if you pay your own way, you come down and you do your own skates and you show them as part of practice and then maybe they can, you can help their team. So that's what I did. I called Milwaukee, I called a couple teams and, and these guys are, you know, fortunate. I was fortunate to get a chance with them. And so just trying to reward that, uh, that decision. And I'm just trying to yeah, keep in the lineup and, and do as best as I can. So mm -hmm. it's a, uh, it's a different, it's a different mentality right now, but I'm, I'm not looking too far in the future, just day by day, trying to score as many goals as I can and, and uh, contribute to the wins. Where are you uh, in like your fitness compared to where you would have been as a player? Do you feel strong in the gym like you were? Or? Oh, I'm way better shape. I, oh, really? Before when I pushed it, I would I would get worse. Like my body would shut down. And so it was really tough for me to do that type of conditioning. Now I feel like the more I work, the more I push, the better I get. So yeah, yeah I've, I'm down to 189 pounds. I think we just did our body fat on about 8.5, 8 8.25% wow. body fat. And that's like better than when I played at the at the peak. Can I ask you about uh, the goaltender, uh, Askarov, I think. Uh, highest uh, drafted Russian goalie in, I think, NHL history, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 11th. Uh, how good is he? Oh, he's unbelievable. Yeah, it's in it's incredible. I told I play with a lot of good goalies. I started my career with Luongo and Schneider, Miller, and then uh, Pekarine <laughs> and Nathan. He's, he's up there. He, he's, he's Honestly, he's, his caliber is pretty intense, uh, pretty high, so... I like working with him. I like shooting on him. He's, he competes on every puck. Doesn't matter if it's a rebound in practice. If it's in warm before a game, he'll die for pucks. Like it's, <laughs> it's pretty fun to be on the ice with him. On trade deadline day, when he's packing his bag to go to Nashville, can you call us and let us know? <laughs> <laughs> they actually have this figurine coming out for ASCII night. They have him uh, bench pressing the net. And I asked him, like, if you get a couple of these, I want, I want, I want a couple of signed of these. It's pretty prehistoric so yeah, yeah he's uh, yeah, he's ready to go well it's awesome seeing you for those of you that uh, aren't watching on one of our platforms uh, uh tv uh cody you look great man and i'm i'm taking credit for a lot of it i want to be honest with you here oh thank you you should <laughs> <laughs> hey and put in a good word for me and the big e if you can do it <laughs> yeah, you, we can do it too on the fourth line with the admirals yeah. you've inspired me <laughs> <Yeah>. cody <laughs> Oh, thanks, guys. All the best, buddy. Yeah, thanks, All the Cody. best. And we'll stay in touch. Cody Hodgson, everybody, from uh, the Milwaukee Admirals, who's
eight years removed and back playing professional hockey at age 34. First game scored, second game scored, third game scored. Uh, listen, he was... Uh, well, welcome back. He was a top 10 pick, was he not? He was 10th, yeah. yeah. And there's so much skill. And, you know, all joking aside, when I when we skate Thursdays, like you can be with a 55-year-old, a 60-year-old, but you know the mind and the, the IQ or the ability to shoot a puck it doesn't leave. Yeah. The the leg le- the, the legs leave, yeah. right? Oh, and, yeah. And, and, and the quickness leaves. But you can see the difference between an amateur and a professional oh, hockey I, I player. I tell people... He, he yeah. came out. He came out the first day we skated together. I'm like, I got to get off the ice. <laughs> you know, I uh, <laughs> I tell people all the time that I was privileged to skate in the summers in Kelowna with uh, Dale Howarchuk and Brian Trotche yeah. in wow. skates. And so, you know, you play in these games, and even a lot of the former pros who were very good pros don't look like those guys who still at their ages, you know, this is 10 years ago, the deception and the vision and, the you know, these guys at 60s, bing, bing, bing. You know, you get a guy like Hodgson, who's as good as he is, um, and, you know, in his 30s still, I'm sure it was impressive yeah. to watch. And I have no doubt in my mind right now that he's in the best shape of his life. Yes, well, you know, it sounds like he has reason to be able to get there now. He's able yeah. to get to new levels, so. And 34? 33 right now? No, I think he turned 34. Okay. Just recently, I think. He play left wing? Leafs get him at the deadline? He's a right-handed shot. Yeah. Uh. But pretty good right side of the leaf. Uh, it's not like he's 37 or 38, and it's yeah. not like he's got a ton of uh, well, wear and tear on him. That you know? is different, right? The mileage has not been it's there. It's not the number of the uh, on the birth certificate. It's usually the, the miles accumulated. Can, can, can I ask you about this? Because I'm fascinated about this. The skate. Like, I... Yeah. Who make... like? Because it's like you're saying that these big names. You got Big E. You're always talking about, like, Cab or like, yeah. Who makes up the rest? Ah, there's some college kids out okay. there, and uh, you know, there's some there's some few pylons out there. I'll be honest <laughs> with you. Of course there is. But I gotta feel good when I score. Oh, you can't get who plays forty net? active great NHLers who plays in net? the hood. Oh, we got we got a mix of like four or five guys in the rotation. Yeah, you gotta have a rotation, yeah. you know okay. and they're good. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Yep. All right. I'm just very, very interested in this. I think I, you, yeah, we lost a couple goalies for a year. And now they're back. There's usually some <laughs> there's kid some who's like 14 who's just happy to be there and, and try. This is, this is the, the the most, and I'll go again tomorrow morning, but this is the most I've skated probably in 10, 15 years on a semi-regular basis. Does it feel and any I've, better I've with consistency? I forgot how much I love it. Yeah. yeah well, I love it. Really it's good in the it. ass yeah. to you know, you wake up in the morning, you got to get your equipment. It still stinks. I haven't played a game in probably three years. Oh, you can have Borneo. Putting equipment on is labor. It's work. You it's work. The reason that, get once you're out to there, the it's skate. awesome. Get Borneo to the skate. The reason I haven't skated is primarily because of it's like the, the work. They're like, yeah, it's 11 p.m. in, you know, yeah, Vaughn or whatever. And it's like, uh, I'm not doing yeah. that. Well, come out for one skate. Yeah. I'd love to see that. I'm good on my skates. You puke? <laughs> no, you're in great shape. <laughs> I, I just, I love it. Fun group of guys, you know, just that camaraderie in the dressing room before and after. That's a, well, that's the whole reason you go. It's so good. Well, I, I got to tell you, if you stop drinking and people want you to play beer, beer league, that you're missing out on a good portion well, of the fun the, like, sitting around after. I mean, I've been on the same team for eight years with guys, and I often tell people the only reason I continue it going is because I'll never see them again. It's just like an excuse <laughs> yeah. to see these guys I love once a week and have a you know cold beer, hot shower, and yeah. talk to them for a bit. It's it's that's part of the ba- that's most of the battle. Anyways, I just love that he called up an AHL general manager. He's like, I want to play, and you're, he's so good that he's like, yeah, okay, you're on the team, and he's scoring now. Yeah. Like, imagine being that good at hockey. It's great. Well, and you know, it's it's not an easy decision for these clubs to weigh out the pros and cons of having a 22 year well, old or is, yeah, you sure. know, but. Still a very competitive league, and some are independently owned. Some are uh, owned by NHL clubs. Some want to win. Some want to make the playoffs. Someone wants to make money yes. in, in, with gates. The coaches are trying to make the NHL, too. They want to win these games. Yes, sir. Um, should we game time it up? Want to game time it? Yeah, let's game time it. Oh, wait, let me get my, uh, my read here. Hold on a second. 
It's game time. It's game time. I should I should know this after reading this every single day for 90-something shows. It would be a shows. fun test if you could put that paper down and, and uh, see what you could do here. It's game time. I'm lost. <laughs> it's game time. Presented by Bet365. <laughs> Visit the app for the latest odds and find out why it's never ordinary at Bet365. Must be 19+. plus. Ontario only. Please play responsibly. Now, there's only two games on the schedule tonight. I wish you could bet on it if Rempe was going to fight or not. But I don't think you can. I was perusing while you guys were talking to Cody, and I, Nicky, I can't. Good old fashioned. I, I, can't, I can't think of an easier way to kind of. Yeah, I mean, like, will he fight? Make money. Up, yeah, make send money. Text. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, he's also fought every game or tried to. So, yeah. um, I think the Columbus Blue Jackets uh, are terrible. I know that's a really hot opinion from me. Yeah, risk. And that. they just ended the Rangers nine game winning streak. So going to Madison Square Garden, everybody's fired up. I like the New York Rangers minus a goal and a half tonight at minus one oh five. I think they're probably gonna run it up on them at Madison Square Garden. Minus two and a half is a reasonable. Yeah, you there. could you could go there too. Yeah. And I the blues, did they play last night? Maybe is that why? Plus 245 tonight for them to play in Edmonton. The Oilers are minus 305 favorites to beat the St. Louis Blues. Seems like a huge number to me. Um, but if you wanted to, you could bet on Connor McDavid, the guy who can't score anymore. He's just forgotten how to score. You could bet on him scoring a goal tonight at minus 110. They're not giving you a big number because no, they know it's coming. It's got to be coming the here Blues eventually. played in Winnipeg last night. Okay, yeah, so yeah. there you go. And they lost to the Blues, who have now won four in a row, I believe. So they're getting back on track. Uh, something else in that game, if you want to have a little bit of fun, give me a Zach Hyman goal at plus 105 on his trek towards 50 more goals, or 50 goals for him in his first 50-goal uh, season. Uh, that was game time. Presented by Bet365. Visit the app for the latest odds. And find out why it's never ordinary at Bet365. Must be 19+. plus. Ontario only. Please play responsibly. Steve Aliquette, who we had earlier in the show that uh, we spoke of uh, uh at the top of the hour, suggested that maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea if the Rangers, the coaching staff, Chris Drury didn't play Rampy tonight. Didn't play him at all. Yeah, didn't play him at all. Well, I, I, I don't know, I don't know that, how that I feel like about punishment that. punishment to me. I, for a guy who's put his soul on the line here in I, four games. I think, I think there'd be a lot of disappointed fans, and it's not so much that they're hoping, and they are. Let's not make any mistake. There's a lot of people still hoping that they're going to go at it again tonight. But I would rather almost a coach or a team publicly saying, we don't want him fighting tonight. We've Save instructed him, him not be, to fight yeah. tonight, but he's playing. But then you kind of take away some of his effectiveness, right? Yeah. If, he, if you the publicly only, To me, the only way you limit it is you put him in the press box. That's the only way you really well, stop him from doing I, it. I think you can but, tell him that you don't want him to fight, but you don't have to tell the opposition. The other thing is, like, genuine fear for his eye. His, like, his, he's in bad shape. You know, you don't want to take... You don't want to become Jake McCabe's nose. You <laughs> can't just take a you lick. put and, a visor on him, then? If there's a... If sure. there's a it's, it wouldn't be the first time a player played with a visor or a cage... You mean, like, a bubble. Protect a, like a bubble. A bubble yeah, yeah, to okay. protect a cheekbone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Hey, but you just tell him, hey, could you just not? Unless this guy jumps you here, we need you badly. Could you just not? Yeah, he's not looking so hot. Like, look at that picture. All right, it's a black guy. Please, we've all had him, Sammy. <laughs> uh, you get a black guy like that without real damage under underneath. I don't know. I didn't fight much. <laughs> I wasn't much of a fighter either. <laughs> like, it's been incredible though. Like, from zero to a hundred miles an hour, and just the attention that it. It, it grabbed right away. Like the seconds after that fight with uh, Delorier, like we all watched it because it's it went viral and it's one of the first things you open up your phone and you could find. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing that you found was that fight. Yeah, and I, I loved 32 it. 32 PIMs in five games so far. Yeah, has he had over six minutes of ice yet this, the, the uh, game? Wow. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the answer. But he does have a goal and an assist to go with it, too. So how he's getting on the score sheet. He had four I, shots. I think he had 15 minutes of penalties and 13 seconds of ice time against the Devils. Like, he wasn't... He was like, against the Devils. Oh, wow. Yeah. Time on ice per game. You know, 13 the, seconds. The yeah. one thing that, that, that really stands out for me with this kid is that, like, I've been in a call-up situation, and I've seen call-ups with tough guys and they knew what was coming mm -hmm. 
they'd be quiet about it. There'd be a maybe some anxiety that came with it. Like there seems to be nothing like this for this twenty one year old. It's like having a beer for him these few fights. Yeah. Like and then he he speaks of fighting Matt Martin and he's telling the story about the conversation in the penalty box yeah. and he genuinely loves it. Mm-hmm. And my experience is the guys who generally love it are the scariest ones of all. Yeah, absolute nut bars. I, I mean, I know there's a number of them who feel that way, but I don't even understand that. He's not phased. Like, yeah. this is like, this is Tai Domi territory where this yeah. guy loved it. Mm. Loved yeah. it. And yeah, and we'll see. You kind of run. I'm sure it's one of those things where, like, the league likes it. We're talking about it. It's getting lots of air. But also, there is kind of, you know, people fighting his. Yeah. You know, become a little bit more oh, no. sensitive a topic, right? So For sure. Because mm-hmm. now everybody's well aware of concussions and, yeah. you know, the risk. Depending on who you talk to, the link of CTE. Yep. And it's. It's always in our faces now. So, mm-hmm. and I'm sure it's going back to the kid as well. But you know what? He may get to a point where it's like Chara got to, where people understand that he's the guy and no one wants to do it. And he gets to kind of dictate that space and create that space for his teammates where he's gone through the league, he's fought most of the guys, and he has that level of respect from people that he will, and he doesn't have to do it as much. I mean, that does happen for guys, right? Yeah, it does. Um, and then it puts the onus on another team to go, okay, if they've got this missile on that side, I, I need one. It's an to, arms race. I, I need to, I, I need one just in case myself. That's and then uh, are we, the are, but the problem is you can't find these guys. There's yeah. just not that many out there. No. Unicorns for sure. All right. Uh, take a break. Yep. Mm-hmm. Winnipeg on the, on the other side. We got uh, plenty to get into with our NHL news and notes. You just mentioned Winnipeg. Gary Bettman visiting Winnipeg. He met with corporate. He met with fans. He met uh, with, I'm sure, the team. So how concerned is Gary Bettman? How concerned should the fans be? We'll get into that and more. When we return to Real Kipper and Bourne. Welcome back to the Real Kipper and Born Show. Nick Kiprios, Justin Bourne, Sammy McKee. All right. Commissioner of the NHL made a trip to Winnipeg, Manitoba to reassure everyone that Winnipeg Jets aren't going anywhere. You know, the first thing that came to my mind uh, was the Kyle Dubas. Oh, everything's great. Great. Everything's great. <laughs> Things are great. Yeah. Uh, do we have any sound, Sam? We do. We do. We have a Gary Batman clip. All right. Let's Talk go to it, it, and then we'll come out. Yep. Mark's view, but Mark isn't issuing any deadlines. Uh, he's focused on what he can do to make sure the fan base is maximally engaged, and I applaud the effort. But again, we're not operating under the sword of Damocles or on a razor's edge. This is part of the evolution of what franchises sometimes go through. Uh, I remember a number of other Canadian franchises, for example, some of them considered to be small market, where the season ticket base aged out and they had to go rebuild it with younger fans. It happens. Let's be clear about something, okay? I believe that this is a strong NHL market, and it will adjust. Uh, everything's great. <laughs> There's the one I was thinking of. Is he talking about Edmonton? Or the fan base edged out, considered small market? Would that be Calgary? referenced there? I don't know. Str- Ottawa? Strong market, but strong enough in 2024 now? I don't know. The issue here, there was no issue. And then Mark Chipman came out and said, No, there's an issue. An issue with attendance. Yeah. He said, I wouldn't be honest with you if I didn't say we've got to get back to 13,000 season tickets. The place we find ourselves in right now, it's not going to work over the long haul. It just isn't. To me, that is pressing the panic button to try to get people to go, oh, God, and go buy pity tickets. Pickets? Yes. Which, to me, is not a long-term strategy. 
I think you're not wrong in terms of it's a wake up call without it looking like a wake up call. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's Gary Bettman right now going into that market and reminding everybody, hey, do you remember like the Where hockey market, NHL's here? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to buy tickets. Yeah. Like it, that's not the case. The case is they're not going right now because. There's a, there's an issue with the economics of maybe that market right now. They maybe they just don't have extra money to go to a hockey game. What's concerning That's is that the, concern. the Jets are first in the Central. They are winning, and they still aren't going as much as they used to. Yeah, it is a concern. I, I, I'm not saying that it's not a concern that tickets are down. I'm saying. It went from nobody was aware there was a mild issue yeah. to people are like, are they going to relocate the franchise? Like, no. But no. I think they just went pretty hard after this. Like, hey, we're worried about this. Yeah, I think I think the, the message is that if this doesn't get fixed over what? Yeah. Like, what are we talking about? A year and a half? No. Two years? Three years? No, yeah. no. If, yeah, if, yeah, yeah. If, if in two years, if that fan base doesn't get up to 13,000 season tickets, they can't stay. The building only holds 15,500. Well, you got to sell 13,000 seasons? I'm looking at the average attendance. They're second last to mullet. Well, but they have the smallest rank but, in the but, league that but, isn't mullet. But the percentage of capacity. There, that's relevant. The San Jose Sharks are last. 79.6. Buffalo is 83.7. And coming in third last is the Winnipeg Jets with 87.6. They yeah. have to stay. They have to sell out. That's the relevant number to me. The next, the next one is the Calgary Flames at 90.5. Yeah, but that building sucks too. And they're gonna but they it. have to sell out. Uh, yeah. Every game. Well, at 15.5, you got to sell it out. I totally get that. Yeah. And I recognize it's a problem and it's a dip right now. But like to get to 13,000 seasons just to make it sustainable, I, I understand it would be nice if they were there. But Well, then you attack the whatever corporate world is out there to That's the hard up. part, eh? That's the hard part is that Winnipeg has the lowest percentage of season ticket sales that are corporations, where in a market like Toronto, almost half of seasons are owned by companies, not people. That is not the case in Winnipeg where it's people, which is way better, obviously, but tougher because when people have tough economic situations, they're less likely to be able to maintain them, so... I get it's a challenge, and I get it's tight, but this to me is, hey, we need to pay attention. The Jets and their fans need to take more care in terms of getting to a game as sort of a civic good than other places do, but I'm not that worried about this. Yeah, I'm worried. I'm worried because you they're think they really lose good. Their team? Uh, over, the, over the next two or three years, yes, they could if things don't. It's getting more expensive. You got to understand too, is that if they're having economic issues today, what would it have been like with no pandemic and a hundred million dollar cap? Maybe people would have more money without the pandemic. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know yeah. enough about economics to suggest Neither that might be the case. But the cap is going to go up. Yeah. And if they don't feel like they're ge generating enough revenue. To support a, point. Uh, a cap today, what's it going to be like when it hits a hundred million Which in, you could in five three, years. Or, three or four you years, bet, exactly. and you're still at nine and a half, ten thousand season ticket holders? Yeah, but I mean, Kip, like it's at nine thousand, whatever, nine thousand five hundred. I don't know exactly what it is right now, yeah. but if they get another, okay, a couple, couple thousand more, they get up to eleven five, twelve. Yeah, you know, like I feel like this is there are small rev, small market teams. Every building is not going to be the bell center. Some markets are supported by the revenue sharing within the league. Like I feel, I feel like they're going to be okay. I get. Listen, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not panicking here either. Yeah. There's plenty of time here, and they're going to make the playoffs. And if they have a good run, they will sell out, and they will create excitement. Mm -hmm. And then individuals or corporations will make key decisions on how much they want to invest of their their budgets yep. into next season. And, you know, hopefully it's it's an afterthought. And meanwhile, the team has won seven of their last eight. They just beat Minnesota, Chicago, Arizona, and St. Louis pretty handily. 
Sean Monahan has been a wonderful fit there. And he's been producing pretty consistently. Before we move on to the actual team, yeah. I'm just looking at these average attendance things, and it's just fascinating to me. I'm looking at the uh, average of capacity, like the percentage. Yeah. The Arizona Coyotes coming in at 100%. Their average attendance is 4,600, and their capacity is 4,600. Yeah. Nothing fishy there, is there? Like, exactly your average is exact like you're selling out every game it's average it's perfect like that number isn't right it's just 100 right on the dot 4600 4, 4, right on the dot yeah right across the board what uh but i imagine a little older to that to what me. are the are most how many teams are at 100 percent? the coyotes dallas stars uh colorado is above dallas is above 100 percent, 100.5 uh Carolina, Nashville, Boston, Seattle, Vegas, and Minnesota. Interesting list. Yeah. What are the what what's Toronto? Toronto is, I'm just looking here quickly. They are 99.8%. Way to go, Doug. Some guy who didn't go one yeah, time. You nailed it. Yeah. Anyways, just thought that was fascinating with the Coyotes. We can All move right. on now. Uh, Vancouver Canucks. Yep. Sid won't let the Penguins die. I don't know if he's going to have much choice because the, the season is shrinking fast. I don't know, uh, man. Everything's great. Like, what kind of run do they have to be on in their next 20-plus? You know why it's not as bad as it looks? Because the game's in hand? That, yes, definitely a big thing. But third place in the Metro currently belongs to the Philadelphia Flyers. So they're not even chasing that second wild card spot as so much as they're chasing third in the Metro. The Flyers have 69 points in 60 games. You know, Penguins have 62 and 56 games. So, you know, they've got enough. They're, they're not that far back if they win a few in a row. They've won three in a row. They keep her going here. They, they'll be in the mix. So, so you have four and four starting the playoffs, or you got five and three? What do you mean? At, uh, five playoff teams out of the, uh, oh, yeah. the Eastern Conference no. or three out of... Three the out Metro. of the Metro. Three out okay. of the Metro. That's so it. who's who's dropping for Pittsburgh to make it? The Flyers? Flyers would be dropping. Yep. That's Oh, a, I don't know, man. Although they did just hang yes. five on the Tampa Bay yes, Lightning. Yes, they did. In the third period. I don't think, six I don't know if Torts is going to let this team just fade into the sunset here. Um, Just wanted to note on Sid before we move past it. He reached 1,000 even strength points last night. The other guys to do that are Wayne Gretzky, Yarmer Yager, Gordie Howe, Mark Messier, Marcel Dion, Steve Eiserman, Ron Francis, and Phil Esposito, and now Sidney Crosby. Wow. So a couple Solid of, list, that yeah, was a couple of night, uh, A couple of shows ago, we didn't get to... Uh, we had sound of Sid talking to a former coach of his, Tony Granado, and mm. Tony was on the set of TNT, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And uh, it, it was, I thought it was fantastic, and... You know, Tony being the class act that he is, uh, basically just thanked Sid for being Sid. And uh, like a, a wave of emotion, you could see it come right through your screen through through Sid, and he got choked up. Yeah. We don't see Sid choked up a lot. You know what I don't love about that is that that means he recognizes where he's at in his career too, right? Oh. People started to have allowed themselves to have like reflective moments. How can it not? Yeah. Like there's a lot of history there. The season's not going the way he'd like. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm with you. We have the clip. You want to hear it? I'd love it. Okay. Let's play it. Yeah. Th thanks, Sid. And, and uh, you know, we've been discussing all along how important and how well you represent our game. And as always, after a tough game like this, to take a few minutes and be smiling, wear your Penguins hat on forward with pride. Uh, thanks for being Sid. That's just all I got to say. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, Sidney Crosby, really appreciate it. Yeah. Listen, uh, I, did you hear it? Yeah. Like, yeah. I got it. I mean, I mean, maybe maybe it's more visual that I saw him, but I, I'm telling you that this guy is so guarded and he's so such a pro yeah. that I, I, I sensed what you did, JB, mm -hmm. that there was a, a reflection there that went far deeper than just maybe their relationship, but it's where am I? What it's am like, I doing? It's like, Tony, 
I'm, I'm dragging these scumbags <laughs> along every day. This Kyle Carlson <laughs> doesn't give a damn. <laughs> this Kyle dude was brought in these guys. They're all the same in the bottom six. Yeah. No one's ever hit anybody. Yeah. Malkin has a sweat all year. He left the cupboards <laughs> empty in Toronto, and now he's doing Help. the same thing here. Yeah, he's uh, seeing seeing some, having some issues but in pits. Sid always, wasn't always buttoned up. Remember back in the day when, like, young Sid? when he, who's no. he, with Sid's the been Flyers? his whole career. No, the all Flyers. Right. And he's like... Because uh, I don't like them. Because I don't like them. You don't remember that clip? It's like an all timer. No, he was I, asking about the Flyers. Some oh, people, some God. people have been old from birth. Yeah. Um, I've been a pretty old guy most of my life. Sid, Sid feels like he's been an uh, old guy people, his whole life. You know, Zach Hyman. This, this part of Sid's career has been incredible, and I've loved Sid ever since the World Juniors, since he was in, you know, uh, Ramuski. Mm -hmm. But like. There was a, at the start of his career, Sid the Kid, he was a whiner. People hated him much. He yeah. cried to the refs. Yeah. If you remember, Ilya Kovalchuk, Ilya Kovalchuk clowned him by, they got in a big scrap, and then he Sid got put in the box, and he scored the power play goal, and he went by the box and pointed right at Sid. Like, there was moments early in his career, where, but then he's turned into the, the pro's pro, so. Right. I don't like him. But that's like part him. of what you've loved about Sid yes. and valued is that he is, he has that fire, <laughs> right? That Our show is so predictable. Kipper brings up. The Canucks, and I'm like, ah, Sid. And then we talk about Sid for 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Squirrel. Yeah, sorry. All right. Canucks. Like the Canucks. Canucks. Uh, drop an overtime uh, loss to Sid. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the record is in February. 500? 5-5-2 five, five and two or something? Yeah, it's not uh, not been great. Their past not been great. Uh, six games, their only win is against Boston. They've lost to Winnipeg, Minnesota, Colorado, Seattle, and Pittsburgh last night. So, you know, every team hits the skids at some point over the course of the season. Um, you know, is this just a regular lull to you? Or is this Elias Pettersson sabotaging things <laughs> as we said? Oh, we we mad you say. First uh, off, I mean, we, we knew that was going to We had happen. an in-depth conversation about his contract situation yesterday. Did you guys get any feedback sure at did. all? Sure yeah. did. That we're creating something out of nothing. Really? Because yeah. I got a little bit of, uh, is, is this... Matthew Kachuk all over again. A guy who just does not want to be in Canada. Well, just is this is this going to go into the end of the regular season when it's like I'm probably not going to resign here, so you might want to trade me now kind of thing? I mean, if he feels that way, he should say those words. That would help the Canucks well, out. Well, Matthew so you... didn't say them until the season was over. You don't, right. you don't want to do that. Right. Yeah, I guess you don't give him a... If you're Matt, in, uh, Matt, I I mean, I don't want it for my Canuck fan friends, but can you imagine what a trade request for Elias Patterson would do to the the market? That would not be good right no, now. No. Because no. they're having their best. That's what su I, I feel for the fans there. Well, listen, we, the, the Jets are in first, and we just talked about them and their arena situation. Canucks are in first, and I now mean. we're talking about it sucks. Patterson contract. Because they've, hey, they've welcome to pro sports. No, I know, Kipper, but, like, I'm a fan, unlike you. Like, you don't. You don't care about any of the teams, but I I care about you the care about anything. <laughs> I, I'm so insensitive. I care about the Toronto Maple Leafs, and I care about them succeeding. And I understand if you're a Canucks fan, where you're like, "Wow, finally, we're good again. Like we actually have a team that feels like they could win something." And then just holding over your head this entire time is Pedersen being like, uh, "I don't feel like talking. I know, but I don't feel like talking." It's reality. It's pro I know, sports. I understand and, all hey, that. Kipper. Be, be be a pro, Sammy. Just I get everybody it. I get it. from from Vancouver management to to Petey to the fans. Just handle it. Just handle it. Manage it. Do better than Tavares did in managing the market well, on your way out the door. In I the old say. days, you could lie, Tavares with the Islanders, yeah. right? He didn't you, you lie. Can, he didn't lie. He's just he no. exercised his right as a well, free agent. Lies a strong I word. Don't think he lied either. You can. Um, Deceit. Is that better? How about a fib? I don't think it's fib. <laughs> None of those fib. You don't really like it here. I want to stay. Maybe. Who, <laughs> Maybe. Who, who wrote this article on the It's Frustrating Canucks Momentum? Uh, Ian McIntyre. Ian McIntyre. Yeah. So one of the paragraphs in McIntyre's article is, uh, listening to the Canucks players and Rick talk, and it feels like the team's 5-5-2 five, five, and two February is a disaster. To be sure, it would be worse if conference rivals like the Colorado Avalanche. He goes on to list the rest of the division. Struggling. Abs. Four, five, and one in their last ten. Dallas Stars, four, three, and three. Vegas, four, five, and one. Edmonton, five, four, and one. These are good teams. Yeah. These are cup contenders. Losing a few games over a ten-game stretch does not 
kill your season. They're a good team. I They're agree. a good team. Good goalie, good defense. I, I Like I've said a million Number times. Number one center. Like Number watching, one D. Like watching them play a lot. Uh, uh, everything's great. Everything is great. Ottawa seem to have had some uh, good synergy going into Nashville, except uh, they lost. The team's and, a frustrating team. And frustrating Josh Norris team. is hurt again. Yeah, it sucks. It sucks. You know, you know we just talked about Drysdale's shoulder. Like, Norris is now a young kid with multiple, yeah. you know, hamburger shoulder issues. It's not good. I played yeah, those guys. You two like, surgeries. Pops two, out all the time. Two surgeries on the shoulder, didn't he? Yeah, and young, you know, so that is, that's a, a concern for them. I would say all these other Ottawa concerns this year, a lot of them feel fixable to me, like need some veteran guys, need some D, need, you know, need some goaltending. That's all fixable. If the guys who you have as a part of your core, like, all right, we're going to turn around on the backs of Kachuk and Norris mm -hmm. and, you know, whoever you consider in that, having one of them be, you know, this injured this often this early is one of the genuine red flags of the rebuild. That yeah. doesn't sound like any type of major trade is coming. They might tweak a few things. You uh, don't think they'll move off one of Chikrin and a Shabbat? I don't think there's enough time to pull off a Chikrin trade, to be honest no with Shabbat. you. Unless they've been working behind the scenes that nobody would know about. Feels like it would be one of those ones that would happen pre-deadline. If It's, it's not going to be like Chikrin moves at 2.34 p.m. on the deadline. It's a bigger one than that. Because I don't know what's right for the Senators team, but this season has been so dis disappointing for them. Shabbat makes eight million, and I want him at eight million. I you want, do? I do. I like I don't, Shabbat. I I believe that you'd have a a tough time finding a team to take him at eight million. Well, bucks. that's so. If you don't have to, can put you give up me much? A, can you give me a team that could plays use him all the time? He plays twenty five minutes a night. You know when he's on. Um, so he's a left shot guy. Tampa you know, offensive. Yeah, Tampa was. They've kind of been rumored to be in on everyone, right? Hannafin has come mm -hmm. up, and any sort of name that can produce offense and replace Sergachev and his money, you know, could Shapot be that? Yeah, he's playing 23-58 this year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, plays 24 minutes in his sleep. Quickly before we go, how about the Flames, boys? They just Can't won't lose. Quit. Four they in a row the, now? I know. And Against the teams playoff they teams. Yeah, who they beat? They beat the Bruins, LA, Bruins Oilers. Jets, Oilers. And crazy. Yeah. Didn't you love Gary Galley on our show the other day telling yes. uh, the management – Bugger, bugger off. Yeah. Is that a nice way to put it? Yeah. Conroy's like, sorry, gals. Scrap, yeah. beat it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, gals. I'm about, to get, I'm about to get a boatload of picks here <laughs> in prospects. But, yeah, we're going to load it up. But it does suck if you're on that team and you're a cadre and you're like, we're hot. It, there is a different feel for a, a team like Calgary to unload than it is Kyle Dubas' Pittsburgh Penguins. Like, they're, that's a team that you go, oh, my God, how many years would they need to come back? Mm -hmm. Five? No, I agree. And then Calgary, you, you go on. see it. Uh, Calgary can be next year's version of Vancouver, possibly. For sure they can. If you keep Markstrom. Yeah, Markstrom, and you you like the young kid in Zari, and Kadri's kind of playing well. Huberto can still find it and have a good year. You like Uyghur a lot. Anderson's great in the back. Added, added a lot of good who players. Can score and like... This is the thing with Vancouver that we said last year, too. They had a lot of good players, even when they were losing. I know Calgary's winning right now, but you can see a quick turnaround. Okay, quickly. Rangers, Columbus, we see a big fight no. tonight or not? I don't know. I, I hope he doesn't go. I do, too. I do not want to watch the bunch again. Yeah, I'm watching that game. I'll watch it. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, our thanks to Steve Valaket, who does an amazing job. And Cody Hodgson, now. Great interview, too. Star player with Milwaukee Admirals. And we wish him the best of luck moving forward. Enjoy your games tonight. And we are back tomorrow for Off the Rails. Thursday. It's Thursday. Is today only Wednesday? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> N never mind. <laughs> see you tomorrow. Yeah, let me just see you tomorrow.